Joining me now is Michael Zara from Drone Delivery Canada, the, the CEO of Drone Delivery Canada. Michael, uh, immediately when I hear Drone Delivery Canada, my first question goes to, when will there be a pizza delivered to my home by drone? Um, it's coming, uh, but based on the current regulations, it's more of a of a B2B, business-to-business type application, but you will eventually see uh, residential deliveries for things like uh, like food in the next little while. So recognizing the regulations that exist in the industry, how does Drone Delivery Canada uh, fill a niche now uh, by using drones to deliver things? What type of markets are you looking at and, and where are things going with it? Yeah, I mean, if you look on, you know, YouTube, you'll see cute videos of deliveries of coffee and muffins to people's homes in a little, you know, cardboard box with a string and that sort of thing. And I would say those are more hype than anything else. The, the real business and the real industry today uh, where you're seeing commer like real commercial applications is more of a B2B, business to business type model. And I would say more remote, rural and suburban. There aren't really on mass, at least in, in North America, uh, urban deliveries and certainly things, as you mentioned in the first question, things like food and these sort of things are not really on mass being delivered at the, at the residential level. So really B2B, suburban, rural, remote. And so when we talk about uh, especially remote applications, are we talking about uh, things like medical supplies? Like what, what type of things would be, how would it be applied in a, in a, a remote situation? Sure. Well, using Canada as an example, there are, you know, close to a thousand Indigenous communities and there are obviously thousands of more non-Indigenous communities and a lot of them tend to be uh, rather remote, uh, coastal, uh, on islands or where access is difficult. And that's that's one of the, of the many use cases for, for drones. So, you know, that's really where you're seeing the, uh, the applications at the beginning of the industry, starting with uh, remote indigenous communities and then the other non-indigenous communities that are still remote. So that's that's kind of where uh, things started and then it kind of moved to um, more commercial industrial applications, uh, more uh, rural, more suburban, and then definitely medical is something that has uh, been a priority. So you could be delivering medical supplies, a lot of these communities, uh, they have a very, very, very high cost of food, unreliable supply of food in addition to medicines and these sort of things. So any of those sort of things that would improve quality of life are particularly important for, uh, for remote communities and, and lend themselves perfectly to drones. And there's a partnership with Air Canada. What, what goes into that partnership and how does that play out? Sure. So we, uh, we signed the partnership agreement with Air Canada, uh, I guess it was a little over a year, maybe a year and a half ago now, and they are acting as a reseller agent for our solution. Uh, first of all, in Canada, and then in the last year or so, uh, adding international opportunities. So we leverage their expertise, obviously, in, in cargo and leverage their uh, global network of opportunities. And, you know, for many people, when they talk of drones, uh, it's in a, a gift-giving sense, Christmas drones, uh, small home use. There are uh, greater ties to the airline industry and these drone applications than there would be to the uh, non-commercial drones that people use. What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, training, and, and uh, I'm sure it's longer than you'll ever be able to tell me, but where are you drawing your pilots from for those maybe young drone operators that think, hey, maybe this is a career option for me someday? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I mean, it's definitely been an industry that's exploded over the last little while. And, you know, definitely there are career opportunities. We're hiring for people for positions that that didn't exist before. So it's, you know, it's definitely, you know, something that, uh, you know, young people might want to look at. But, you know, looking at it from a consumer point of view and then looking at it from a commercial point of view is very different. For the consumer, you know, they can buy, a, you know, a small drone at a, at a Walmart or something like that, and they can get a basic license, which is just basically a an online test and you pay $10 or a more advanced license and they're going to do something a bit more commercial. Uh, but then you get into, you know, something that we're doing and it's a completely different world. We, uh, we have our own training programs. Uh, we have our own certifications uh, from the government for our drones and our drones are, you know, significantly larger than, you know, what you'd see as a, you know, consumer type drone. So it, it's, it's very much a different world for us from a regulatory point of view. 
and then from a training point of view, but just you know, regarding, you mentioned pilot. So our system runs unmanned automatically. And then we have an operations control center, which is actually my virtual background on this. Uh, on this uh, you can see in the Zoom. The, uh, our, our operators in the uh, operations control center here in Vaughan, just outside of Toronto, they are monitoring our projects 24 seven, but we don't really have pilots that are manually flying the drones. We might, from a safety point of view during the implementation or uh, testing and these sort of things, but really the system flies unmanned automatically. That's interesting. Um, so let's go blue sky here for a moment. If there's, if there's no slowdowns, there's no limits, where do you see drone delivery in Canada going? You know, the, the, the applications are, are extremely broad. At a high level, if you look at the use cases, and I'm talking more consumer, sorry, not consumer, I'm talking more you know, commercial industrial type applications, which is what we're focused on. The, the, the first use case is really where access is difficult. And again, that could be indigenous communities. It could be mining, oil and gas, which tend to be uh, remote. Uh, it could be a variety of applications where, where access is difficult. Last mile is very, very inefficient and expensive for, for couriers. And then the next application would be where time is critical. So maybe you can get there, but if I can get there more quickly with the drone, uh, that could be saving lives in healthcare, medical applications, emergency response, which we've done with defibrillator drones, for instance. Um, or time, you know, could be money for industrial applications. And then the third uh, is really uh, limiting person-to-person -person contact. And this came about as a result of the pandemic. Uh, you may have communities, Indigenous communities, for instance, or uh, buildings within a hospital campus that want to self-isolate, prevent the cross-contamination of the virus, but you need to keep the supply chain open. So drones are ideal for that. So that's really, you know, the at a high level, the use cases. But then the vertical markets are, are very, very broad from last mile courier packages, postal mail, uh, as I mentioned, medical, pharmaceutical, oil and gas, you know, repair parts and uh, mining uh, repair parts or bringing core samples or water samples out for testing uh, from those sort of things. So, I mean, very, very, very broad applications. But if, if there were no regulations at all, I would still say, you know, that's where the industry would be because that's where I think the best ROI is from a commercial industrial point of view. And that's where the best, you know, quote unquote ROI is from a, a social point of view when it comes to healthcare and quality of life and these sort of things. So I think if the regulations didn't exist at all, we wouldn't actually like that because we, we don't want, you know, cowboy airspace. We like the fact that there are regulations, but I think you would see a lot more of, you know, urban deliveries and, and, e-commerce delivers to your home and, and the food and that sort of thing. But the regulations don't really permit that. So that's not the uh, uh, the immediate drone world, but definitely coming. So that's, that was my next question. What type of restrictions do you face uh, or any challenges in the industry? Are there changes you would like to see made or are you pretty happy with the space as it is right now? No, it's, it's a good question. And, you know, you could look at regulations as a, a disabler because they prevent you from do th doing things. But I think in... In regulated industries like you know aviation, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, these sort of things, there's a genuine need for regulations. As I mentioned, you, you don't want some cowboy airspace where anybody can do anything because that would be a disaster for us and be a disaster for others and for airline pilots and et cetera, as you can imagine. So we do welcome the regulatory environment. I think it's appropriate for where the industry is now, uh, you know, given that it's you know still somewhat of a nascent uh, industry but we are definitely seeing the regulations relax over time. And we have a very collaborative relationship with Transport Canada, who is the regulator in Canada. We're actually on a, a committee called the Drone Advisory Committee to work uh, side by side to map out regulations uh, collaboratively with the regulator. Um, so, you know, we do welcome where they are and they are relaxing. And I think they're relaxing at the appropriate pace, just given that the, uh, the industry needs to uh, continue to gain some legs. So you're not necessarily in favor of Uber drone? You know, I, I think, you know, I think those things will come. I think long term, you will see a migration to business to consumer. Um, I think it'll probably be healthcare first, and then it'll be sort of sundry items like, you know, mail and e-commerce and parcels and, and, and food and that sort of thing. And then much longer term, I mean, many years out, I think you'll see unmanned flying taxis for sure. But those are, those are quite a few years out. Unmanned flying taxis. 
We will see it here first. Yes. You will see that in our lifetime, but it's still a few years away from a a regular point of view. So uh, the unmanned portion of it, and I I don't want to throw a curveball at you, but from what I've been learning in other interviews and discussions, um, I think I have a, a legitimate question that may or may not apply. Um, you've got an you've got an unmanned service, which then uh, puts you in some respects uh, sending information that needs to be protected. Uh, and I'm reading a lot about quantum computing um, and uh, security software and things of that nature that that are you know developments that are also happening within Canada. How does that play a role in your business? I guess in the broader scope of yes, you have uh, well one you have uh, flying vehicles that that may be uh, in the public. Um, what type of lengths do you have to go through as a company to protect your network and your network environment to ensure safety for uh, your clients? And, and the public at large? I hope that's not too hardball a question. It's more curiosity, really. No, it's, it's a good question. So, I mean, you know, privacy and security tend to tend to pop up uh, when you look at, uh, uh, we look at this industry. So I'll, I'll address, you know, uh, privacy first. We don't fly based on a camera on the drone. So we're not flying over somebody's house and, you know, snapping photos of, of you know, private people and their private property. So, but that's not a concern at all. Uh, our system flies again unmanned automatically based on the GPS coordinates and et cetera, et cetera. So no issue from a privacy point of view. The From a security point of view, our, our system is, is quite secure. We've got redundant um, flight controls. We've got d- redundant communication systems. Uh, all of the controls are, are encrypted. Um, the drone is preloaded with a route. So we're not constantly sending commands to it that somebody could is hack into and, and redirect it. And then when we do communicate to the drone, if, if necessary, it's sent from multiple sources that need to synchronize, it's encrypted, et cetera, et cetera. So from a security point of view, we feel that we, we've got a, you know, a rather robust cybersecurity uh, posture and, and uh, you know, we're, we're in good shape there. And then when it comes to the data, you know, the same thing, we have to collect data uh, for ourselves operationally. We also keep records for Transport Canada because these are federally regulated aircraft, just like any other aircraft with a tail number. So we, we gather that data, but that, that's, you know, kept uh, rather secure as well. So we think we we do a good job on the security and the, and the privacy front. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad you were able to just throw down an answer like that because it was really off the top. But it's just a curiosity. And I think that's a, a lot about why I like doing these interviews is because, um, you know, as Canadians, we often think that we're on the tail end of the technology curve or, you know, the joke being you know, growing up in the 80s is that we would get fashion two years late or, you know, things like that. So to see Canadian companies on the forefront, on the on the bleeding edge of technology and innovation uh, as a Canadian, it makes me quite proud. Uh, and I'm really, uh, I'm really grateful that uh, I have this chance to talk to you. Is there something... Uh, that we haven't asked about that you feel is important for people to know about Drone Delivery Canada? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say if you want more information, you can go to our website, dronedeliverycanada.com, or visit us on social media, and you can actually see some some real videos at real projects on our, on our YouTube. But I would just say that this is an industry that I think people should watch. It's uh, It's not... You know, it's not new uh, because people have been using drones for you know, imaging and mapping and data collection for a very, very long time. Delivery is, a, again, a little bit of a nascent industry, as I, as I mentioned earlier. But I think this is an interest, industry that people should watch. And uh, I, I think it's, it's obvious to me it's not a fad. If you look at any of the, any of the research, uh, I've even heard quotes uh, directed at some of the big logistics companies saying that, if you're not actively involved in the drone industry for delivery, you might not be around in 10 years. So this is something that's maybe new, but I think it's right at the inflection point of exponential growth. So very, very exciting going forward. So I would definitely, uh, definitely keep an eye on it. And you, you gave that window of 10 years. Is that, is that the window that we're looking at for uh, growth expansion and that sort of migration into uh, more B2B and then you know, consumer type industries? Is it, is it 10 years or is it 20 years before we start to see direct uh, consumer engagement with the drones uh, and products being delivered to them? 
No, I think it'll be much, much sooner than than 10 years. The reference was that if you're a logistics company and you don't get in this, you might not be around in 10 years. But definitely, I mean, we are fully operational and fully commercialized and have customers generating revenue today. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier with the regulations, you know, being uh, enabling to operate and then relaxing, which opens up more use cases, you know, definitely it's something that's happening now. Uh, around the world, and we have relationships with with partners outside of Canada and in Canada, and um, you will see incremental milestones from us, uh, as well as from the industry going forward. But definitely, this is happening long before ten years. It's happening now, literally. So you mentioned uh, how these drones are being used uh, with uh, indigenous communities in remote areas. Do you have any instances uh, recently that you can share on how these drones have been used or projects that have been they've been used on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of a lot of people don't realize that there are close to a thousand indigenous communities in Canada, and they tend to be very remote, uh, so perfect for uh, for drone delivery. And they often, unfortunately, have uh, poor access to health care, reliable, cost-effective food, um, and they are particularly hit by the pandemic. So we actually had uh, very recently two projects in northern Ontario, one with the Beausoleil First Nation and one with Georgina Island First Nation. And they were specific to the pandemic. These are both communities that had a, a mainland plus island uh, component to the community. And uh, not all year round is the ferry available. Um, and they also wanted to prevent the pandemic uh, virus from coming into the community. So wanted to self isolate a little bit, but keep the supply chain open. And we were able to implement uh, a drone solution at both of those communities uh, uh, and it ran very successfully. So very happy with that. Michael, thank you very much for your time today. You will check in with us when uh, Drone Delivery Canada sets up a distribution center in uh, my part of the world, which is New Brunswick or the Maritimes. Uh, but no, this was a fascinating interview and I look forward to following the progress of your company uh, as well as uh, taking my very first flying taxi ride. I, I think you have to go with me though. No problem. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, Michael Zara from uh, the CEO of Drone Delivery Canada joining us today on the show. Thank you once again, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.